to go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, our second webinar um, for our Education Leadership Essentials series. Um, last week, we reflected on assessments that we just finished, the park assessments, um, and this week, we're going to actually talk more about how to support the Common Core Standards using technology. Um, we're going to dive deeply into how we are advancing the standards using technology and what resources and tools support the Common Core state standards. My name is Diane Hauser. I, I work here in Boston Public Schools OIIT with the digital learning team, um, co-facilitating with Blanca. <laughs> Blanca, did you want to introduce yourself at all? Sure. Hello, everyone. I am an Intel National Senior Trainer, and uh, that means that I work very closely with teachers and administrators to help integrate technology into the classroom. And um, I think that we have a small audience, but it's a grand audience today. Um, can we have our participants introduce themselves, please? Hi, I'm Natasha Scott, and I am the Assistant Director for the History Department for Boston Public Schools. Do we have anybody else on? I'm, I don't think we do, so we might, we're going to dive in. Natasha, I don't know if you wanted to show your face at all. It's your call, but um, just uh, we're using the GoToMeeting uh, go to meeting tool. Um, and Feel free to ask questions in the chat feature. You can share links and resources as we, you know, get the conversation started. Um, you can also mute yourself if you needed to um, and change your layout view. So all the buttons are right here in this little screenshot um, reminder here before we get started. Okay. So. How do we support the Common Core state standards with technology? You know, today adopting new literacies really is a must. It's, you know, as we continue to adjust the curriculum to align to the standards, technology is, is essential. It's no longer a, just a nice to have. Um, it's used for research. Um, it's used to support collaboration. It allows for flexible ways of demonstrating mastery of skills. Um, and we're all at different places with this. You know, the amount of technology we have, the type of technology we have differs from school to school. Um, and also our skill level changes. So today, you know, it's very important to have a plan. Planning is critical. So today we're going to talk more about the planning, planning of this, what you need to think of as you plan for integrating technology. And um, we also have some resources to share with you as well. Do we have anybody join that wants to introduce themselves before we go on? No? Okay. Okay, so Blanca. Okay. I'm handing it over to you right now. So we thought that today um, we would start the conversation off by really talking about what the Common Core State Standard says about the use of technology and how students uh, interact with it. Um, the Common Core Standards ask students to use technology strategically and capably, and so that means two things. The first thing is that students have the knowledge and the skills and the experience with tools enough that they understand what tools to use when they're trying to solve a problem. Um, it also means that they have the skills to be able to do that, and so um, there are there's a difference between having like keyboarding skills, for example, and having the skills necessary to actually put together um, a meaningful presentation that conveys a message. So one of the things that we want to ask you are, what are some ways that we can provide students with those opportunities to use technology strategically and capably? And Natasha, since you are our guest, <laughs> perhaps we'll start um, we'll start off with you or, or Diane to just think about what kinds of experiences do we need for children to have in order for them to really learn these skills. Well, I'm thinking that the with our kids, we really have to start at the base level. We have to 
give them that ground foundation work that then they can build off of and you know, learn how to start from the basic of how to even log on to a computer, how to get online, how to um, navigate websites appropriately, and then gradually progress into how to type, how to collaborate online and use different digital tools to get there. And I think, um, I think you know, when we, when we talk about using technology, when we used to talk about using technology, um, some of the experiences that we gave students were really that experience of being in a computer lab, that um, technology wasn't something that they saw as being integral to their learning process. It was, it was a class, right, that we would walk them down to a computer lab. They would have a 40-minute session on you know, creating perhaps a presentation, then they come back into class and then continue on without the technology. So, you know, today's um, classroom, modern classroom looks very different. Today, we um, very often see computers uh, on wheels. So we see carts in the classroom where every child can then pull out a device and use it for when they are trying to do something or learn something. Um, I think what's really important too is not to forget um, the role of the library media specialist in terms of helping students develop those key and critical research skills um, on how to evaluate information, how to search for information online. Um, and so providing students with opportunities to you know, engage in those kinds of learning experiences is really important. I agree. Um, our library media specialists are critical. Um, I'm, Unfortunately, we don't have them in all of our buildings. It would be great if we had library media specialists in digital champs in all of our buildings, because I also think um, teachers need assistance with um, integrating technology in, in practice as well, like a kind of like a coaching style. So um, I see I see it twofold. I see you know specialists or experts or champs, if you will working with students, you know, with specific skills, but I also see the same type of role working with some of our teachers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just to kind of piggyback off that, you know, very often we think of um, someone coming into the classroom to support the teacher in the use of technology, um, but there are also programs that allow students to take on some of that role. Uh, if you're familiar at all with the Mouse Squad or um, Generation Yes used to be curriculum that schools would implement as well. But um, these were distinct opportunities that students would have to actually learn um, a little bit of the nuts and bolts about how a computer worked. And so perhaps they were given some time during the day to actually help troubleshoot some basic issues with the technology. And that was a way to build capacity in a school if you were um, handing out hundreds or thousands of devices. Um, but the other piece is that, you know, it, we absolutely can leverage some of what children already know and use, some of those tools, and we can leverage that knowledge um, in our classrooms because we can, we can use our students also to help other students or help us. So that's, um, so that's kind of exciting, you know, but I think the key thing there and, and the critical thing is that Students need to be able to have experiences with technology to even be able to make decisions and choices about what kind of technology to use um, to solve to solve a problem. Um, and that leads us really to um, the conversation that that we continue to have, and that is we kind of know what we need to do for students. We need to make sure that they have access to technology. We need to integrate technology into our lessons, but we still don't see that um, just on a large scale. And so we talk a little bit about challenges all the time and so that we can help to develop some solutions. But, you know, what, what do you feel are the biggest challenges in helping students learn how to use technology um, strategically? Um, so in terms of challenges, I think part of it is setting up the environment. Um, we always know time is such a constraint in our classrooms. So really setting up the environment so that teachers feel like they have the leeway to say, well, if I'm going to be incorporating technology, it might take a little bit longer in the beginning of the year because it's a logistical piece, how to take out the computers, set up the computers. And the more the kids do that, the smoother it is. 
but it's all a learning curve. You know, that, those basic logistical pieces can be can be a challenge for some teachers, and that alone will prohibit them from taking the next step and overcoming that, the starting point. Sure, that's great. Actually, I, if I could add to that, in addition to setting up the environment, um, I would say time. Um, time to explore, time to collaborate, time to experiment, time to even make a mistake, and you know it's okay to make a mistake so that you know you can try it again another in, at another time. Like, how do we leverage time and or in or build time into professional development? How does it get integrated into professional development? How does it get how does it become a part of like common planning periods um, so that teachers can actually have that experience so it doesn't it doesn't have to be perfect all the time it could be an experiment actually yeah and part of that lesson plan is also being able to help teachers design technology based assessments for students um, we drew up a list um, that really talked about kind of how do we prepare our students and um, you talked about, ex you know, having those experiences, the logistics, of course, is always um, something that we grapple with. Um, consistent use of devices. So some schools may just struggle because they don't have the budget to provide a device for every child or to have computers um, on wheels so that so that teachers have access to them in their classroom. The other thing I think is that those technology based assessments, we need Teachers need time and we need time to be able to plan and create them, to think about them, to talk about them. And then students need the time to be able to use the technology to actually create them. So when we talk about um, like the state assessments, the park assessments, students need to be able to have experience of performing tasks so that on computers before they take those exams, otherwise they really struggle with those performance tasks that they're given um, on those uh, on those computer-based assessments. Something else that's really important is helping students develop the feedback skills um, so that they're able to give each other feedback in a digital way, which is very different than giving feedback face-to-face. -face. So, you know, helping students be able to respond um, you know, even if you have to start with the basics and maybe give them uh, the ability to use some sentence starters, you know, also being able to give them um, and scaffold for them that same experience in a digital online um, format. Uh, and then, of course, we struggle a little bit with um, our keyboarding skills. You know, mm -hmm. keyboarding used to be a part of a curriculum for many schools, and uh, at some point for many schools, um, as they started to move away from computer labs and started to push, push computers into the classroom, you no longer had that time in a computer lab to practice keyboarding skills. And so how do we help students you know, with those types of skills that they need in order, again, to be able to use that technology um, effectively? I remember kicking and screaming, not wanting to go to my typing class. But it turns out that was one of the best skills that I learned as a, as a you know elementary student. <laughs> it was an extracurricular um, activity that I had that my mom wanted me to take. <laughs> yeah. And I think those little skills are what we take for granted because when we went to school, you know, we went to computer class. We learned right. how to type a certain amount of words per minute, <laughs> right? And that's what we did. But teachers now they're trying to get them right into the content because they don't feel like they have the time to say I need to start with <laughs> step one this is how you turn on the computer this is how you type on the computer um, so figuring out how to provide teachers that support so that they know even where to begin whether it's a website that can help take them through the steps um, or some other resource that we have as a district to, to right. share. Absolutely. Um, there is a principal um, I want to say somewhere in the Midwest who shared um, an idea that she that she put in place that kind of was able to save a little bit of time at least in the school. And that was that she had a list of free resources or she has a list of free resources that she shares with parents first thing, the beginning of the school year, August, September. And um, she asks parents, just like she asked them to read with their students, right, with their children every night, she asked them to also take, you know, some time, 10, 15 minutes a night and ask students to use these resources to help them with their keyboarding skills. 
um, in the mm. hopes that she can get her third and fourth graders, you know, writing maybe 30 words a minute. And what they do is sometime in November, the students um, then go into a lab where they're tested to look at their speed. And the students who aren't, you know, who aren't typing at that particular, you know, speed, who really aren't, aren't maybe practicing or proficient, um, will then start to, you know, have time during the day where they're pulled out perhaps at a special and, um, and they have time to practice. But you know, sometimes we have to get creative with the time that we have. That's a great idea, actually. That would be something nice to share with the, um, our Office of Family Engagement um, as a tip, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the other thing that when we talk about the Common Court uh, standards and we talk about the skills that we want children to be able to um, to develop and to be proficient in, um, there are some critical pieces in the standards that that talk about how students should be using technology um, or how students should be presenting information using multimedia um, or how students should be giving and receiving feedback. And one of those um, main components is in really across all the disciplines, but it talks about you know, that children should be able to have experiences where they are collaborating with others, where they are um, giving each other ideas and they are providing each other peer feedback. So if I am um, perhaps a writer who's, who's maybe struggling a little bit, um, if I'm a teacher, I may go ahead and um, pair them up with maybe a student who's a little bit stronger and then, and then show them the opportunities um, that they can have in order to to make each other stronger. So you have one student in the role of a lead, another student um, kind of as a student and a teacher role, and, um, and they're helping each other. And I know Google Apps for Education is a wonderful tool, and I know that Boston State Public Schools has it available for their students and teachers. It's a wonderful tool that allows students to really collaborate in a digital way um, where everyone is in the same document um, and they're able to give each other feedback through a variety of different ways. Um, in this particular image, you see that there's a chat going on right in the document. So that's a real time synchronous chat um, where children can ask each other questions or they can plan out how they're going to approach this particular essay or, or, um, or script or project that they're working on. Um, another way is um, that they can comment on each other's work and um, they can also do some, um, some tracking of changes. So Diane, I think that you have a um, yeah. video that you're doing us. And so who better to listen to but our own students, right? Because <laughs> I have a little short clip here from one of our videos that we produced last year. Um, right from the students. Your stuff would be there. It saves automatically. I make it because we can just share a document. Like, if, let's say you're working with a partner. You can just share it, and you guys can both work at it at the same time. With the Chromebook, it has stuff like the undo button where if you make a mistake, you can click it, and it goes back to the way it was before. You don't need to worry about the mistakes. You can just type and get our work done. It's also easier because we don't have to download like programs to make slideshows or something. You get used to all the controls. It's not as complicated as some other programs. And using the Chromebooks is just fun because it's really small, it's not too large, and it's not heavy. When we did the Google early adoption back in the... Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Saves everything. I love that's my favorite quote of that video. <laughs> love it. What we tried to do also in this section is really try and highlight um, ways that each of the common, uh, each of the core standards um, could look at how to use technology strategically in their own particular core content area. But in truth, something like collaboration feedback happens across all disciplines as children learn to write, read, and give each other feedback. Um, another uh, area that the Common Core Standards um, talks about is this need for students to be able to present an idea clearly using visualizations, graphs, um, and, other, and other types of visual 
um, visual and digital content. And here we have an example of um, perhaps children collecting data, whether it's um, they're collecting data in terms of numbers, so it might be a math class, or it could be a science class where they're studying population growth. But there are different tools that allow you to be able to give the students data or you have the students collect the data on their own by surveying. Um, but then there are tools like this particular one, which is um, really part of the Google Maps software. And it allows me to pull in data that's already been created and create maps, a visualization map of, of information that then I'm able to, as a student, make sense of and present. And so I think that it's really important that when we ask students to create their presentations, that we make sure that in that rubric or checklist that we're giving them of things that they need to include, that we help them develop and we make sure that they include visualizations. Because if we think about the way that we receive content today, a lot of it is, is very visual. Lots of it are, are, I mean, a lot of the information also is like an infographic um, where you have, you know, just some images and a, a little bit of words and the images actually, when you study them, tell a story. So, you know, this concept of using digital media to create a story to, to tell something um, is really, really important. Um, in this example, I'm going to um, let Natasha talk a little bit about how um, you can use technology to um, look at social studies uh, in a different way. There we go. Okay, um, so one of the elements that the history department has been working on this year is curating resources and kind of putting them all together for the 40th anniversary of the of Boston busing and desegregation. So we again, just a model of a way to share information from a historian perspective, we put together this Google site. We had an awesome um, web developer, Jenna, who put it together for us and we gave her the information um, with an overview page, kind of giving that introduction, saying thank you to all the community partners that we had work with us. And then the more interesting when we think about techn technology use, um, in the resources tab, open up for us. So in, in the resources section, what we've done is we have um, taken a variety of different resources from different areas and curated them, put them all in one spot, and within that, there we go, sorry, we're a little slow over here, um, mm -hmm. and put it all in one spot. We've actually used um, an app called ThingLink or a website called ThingLink, I should say. Um, ThingLink allows you to upload images, upload documents, whatever uh, digital resource you're using, and make it interactive. So what we've done is we have some screens, screenshots of different materials, and we've provided information on what's going on to caption. The website, as historians, you always want to make sure that you're using citations, especially when you're doing online research. Um, so we know where our information is coming from as, as students begin to write article, write reports, articles, essays, any sort of sharing of information. Um, a citation, so we give the formal citation, and then just an example of where teachers could use this material for. So when we think about visualizing and uh, be able to display information in a creative way using technology. This is an image of a sixth grade classroom from 1974. And what they did at the end of the year was they wrote an end of the year essay. Hmm. Now this was the year of busing, so they wrote this end of the year essay. And now they went back uh, 40 years later and found some of the students and had them read the same essay that they wrote in 1974. And what we did was we uploaded the image, we made it into a thing link, we embedded audio, so now the kids are able, have access to the primary source of the image, and they also have access to that student reading that same exact essay 40 years later. So we have a couple of students who were identified, and it, um, if you click on these Thanks. play buttons, it will play the audio for you. And we also have the text, too. We have some um, 
one organization had scanned in the actual essay, so we have those documents as well. So students can read it, listen to it, and then analyze the image as well. And finally, we have a map uh, that represents the Boston racial and ethnic demographics of 1970s. And this was actually a series of maps made by a cartographer out of Tufts. And what they did was they were showing how the population and the demographics changed every 10 years, so every decade. And so what we did was we took this image, so here we have a map, think about all the conversations that you could have with this image, talking about where the majority of racial populations are living, and we, again, made it even more interactive. So now we've taken an image, embedded it into ThingLink, and did an overlay of images that are happening around the city during this time period. So kids can go, students, anyone looking at this website, it's a, actually free open source, anyone looking at this website can see images that are actually superimposed on top of that location that they occurred. Okay. So it gives you a sense of you know, what was happening around town. Okay. And so here we, as a history department, we use ThingLink, which was a free website that Jen, our web designer, introduced me to. and we made a primary source even more interactive and students can actually make student accounts and go on so it's really an opportunity to integrate technology in the classroom you could have your students designing images and overlaying information you could have them use you could take a letter and you could have them annotate this letter digitally instead of um, pencil and paper so really this website allowed, provided us the opportunity to represent um, research and information in a different way and to give access to teachers and students as well as they began exploring about busing. Okay, so some of the information was, were websites, some of them were our documents, so it's a variety. Some of them are images, it's a variety of materials that we've curated into this one location. So that's just one example for history and what we've also done is for the teachers we wrote lesson plans and posted them on here as well so here now teachers have lesson plans that they can use these resources um, and different ways to use technology as well whether it was an audio we have some video clips in there we have uh, primary source talk documents we have just an assortment of different items wow. That is fabulous, Natasha. <laughs> really, really powerful. If you think about all of the different thinking that has to go on when a child puts something like that together. So in addition to the research skills and everything else that they need to do to collect that information, even the way they present it, you know, what do I do first? What do I link to first? What voice do I use? Um, that's really, really powerful. It's been an amazing resource and we, we keep sharing it, so we really want to just really have an example of how to use technology in the history classroom. Great. Great. Now, I I'm... Continue to speak about Natasha, too. <laughs> um, I am, uh, I'm going to show a science example, and um, instead of just showing you a slide with a picture on it, I'm actually going to show you um, the actual spreadsheet. So. Um, in, in much the same way where we have children kind of collecting information, in this particular example, which is called Mineral Database, um, children were asked to, um, in a science lab, were asked to test different minerals um, for hardness and for streak and for color. So, you know, think about in what a normal lab would look like. You know, kids might have a piece of paper and they're being asked to, um, you know, to test out the different the different minerals, we had them in pairs. And um, in this particular activity, we actually had all of the students um, creating their own sheets, so testing out all the different minerals on the left-hand side. And then as they went along in their lab, they then you know, filled in the information. And what we did was every pair of students had their own sheet listed and um, and they would go through and either find the information or make a determination or make an observation and record it. Um, what's interesting about um, putting information like this in, in a spreadsheet, um, A, when you do it in pairs, you can really, you know, see how people, how children work together. B, um, we happen to do this um, over a course of a day. So we had about five or six different periods that did it. And in some of our classes, we noticed that students were um, they were going at a little bit slower pace. 
And so one of our classes, especially we had, um, it was a special education class. They weren't really able to go as quickly. They were taking their time and really, you know, thinking about it and asking questions. So what we had that class do was actually the whole class was then in a database. So we had about 20 or so students, maybe a little bit less. And they each, instead of having to go through all the minerals, we gave them maybe about five or six to study and to document. And at the end of that class period, um, we had we had been able to test all of the different minerals and children then were presenting their information to each other verbally as they also looked at this as they also looked at the spreadsheet. And I have to tell you that particular class, I think was so much more engaged because they were creating this database together. Um, we were then asking them to present their information while um, students had a chance to actually look also on the spreadsheet. Um, we showed them how they could um, sort the information. We were asking questions like, okay, which um, minerals perhaps are silver and have um, uh, a black streak? And so we showed them how to come in here and filter information. And, and you know, for students to be able to have that opportunity and to be able to um, look at information in different ways and understand what some of the differences are and why they occur, I think is really, is really powerful. Um, of course, I messed up my filters here, and I don't see anything now. But, <laughs> um, but it was, it was, um, it was, it was. Oh, there it is. Uh, it was a really powerful class because we were able to harness the power of everyone working together um, to accomplish a goal. And I think, you know, it just in in retrospect, it, it really was one of the, my most memorable classes working with um, with the teacher and the technology. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit now about um, the skills that students need to have, right? So we talked a little bit about that before, but, you know, what we're doing here is really preparing kids for college career and life. And so these skills, presenting information, putting information together, telling a story, um, these are all skills that they need to have when they go out into the workplace, when they create presentations in the real world together, um, and they have to work in teams. Um, and I guess I'll just ask the audience, <laughs> the three of us, you know, what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities? What are we looking at besides the ones I've already mentioned? <laughs> um, well, I think part of a big, uh, well, especially in Boston, since we are since we do have the Google Apps for Education, but that concept of collaboration, um, I think sometimes we underestimate how valuable it is, especially using Google. Um, I'm a big Google fan. <laughs> so with uh, the other, actually just the other day, I was collaborating with someone who late in the evening, we were working on writing a letter together, and they had already had a draft of the letter. We sat, both of us were on the computer at the time, at the same time, we had the chat going, we had um, comments going, being threaded throughout the document as we asked questions, recommended vocabulary here. We were both typing, editing, removing elements. So the fact that that's not just a skill that you need in school, but you need it in the real world too. You have to be able to um, be able to clearly explain your thinking, either in a typed out fashion, some sort of written communication. Um, so I think we underestimate that, that sense of collaboration and how important it is, it, not only in terms of of something like a letter, but in a PowerPoint presentation, like different, there's different medias that we're using right. to share our thinking, and we have to be able to kind of bounce between those different mediums in order to make it meaningful. Yeah, definitely. And, and I, I would agree. I would agree with the collaboration piece wholeheartedly. Um, I would also like to add um, how our how we are how our students are interacting with digital content. In a digital environment, you know, are we giving them the experiences, um, you know, to annotate, to curate um, digitally? And I, I feel like, you know, how, you know, how, do, how are we doing that for ourselves as well? I think the more we, as educators, are, you know, engaging in you know, working with content in a digital environment, the more we it's like a, it's a shift. It's like there's a little shift that if we're more comfortable with it, we'll we'll be able to work with our students and being comfortable with it. I think it's critical for them to be 
looking at you know newspapers and articles and books and stories digitally um, being able to highlight annotate curate mm -hmm. and that's not to say I want to throw books away either because I you know I'm one of those people that I have my newspaper digitally Monday through Saturday but on Sunday I like the old-fashioned newspaper you know flipping the page you know sections and pages but how are we shifting from more digital resources versus the tangible ones and preparing students for like electronic textbooks and stuff like that right well I think there's a balance too that mm -hmm. you know we don't I don't I certainly don't, I lived without technology for the, you know, for the beginning of my life and, and even professional career. And there's a balance that we need to strike and almost model for our students because I feel like they have, they have access when they go home to so much of this technology, whether it's in the form of video games or it's on the internet or they're texting on their phones. And right. there has to be a balance where we say, Okay, you know, just for a little while, let's actually just sit here in a group with our computer right. and, <laughs> and collaborate and talk. Right. And, you know, because it's important because you sometimes you lose some of the skills that you yeah. develop just in interacting with a human being. You know, that ability to empathize um, with, with another human being. That's kind of hard to do if you're always interacting in a digital way or always, you know, using technology. So... Those are still important skills to have for life. I think another thing that we uh, take for granted, too, are the basic skills like organization. <laughs> Just yeah, because we have definitely. everything on our computer does not mean <laughs> that we don't need to put them in folders and organize right. them in some sort of system so that we can find them later. <laughs> How much time do we spend or I spend looking, searching for my <laughs> Google Docs? <laughs> Yeah, and, and one of the things that I see a lot of now, even in app form, comes more in app form than anything else, are those um, those note-taking tools, something like Google Keep, where you can keep your tasks organized, or even, even project management tools. I see so many students using um, tools like Trello or like Rike to manage their projects, or even Google Calendar. Um, so, you know, that's not something that I used to see before, but I think in today's busy life where we are, you know, trying to make sure that we have all the things that we need, um, I think that it's, those are, that's also an important skill, that project management skill. Um, this next section um, is really meant to kind of help, uh, and just as a, a tip, um, to help us as educators be able to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing and how I'm supposed to be incorporating technology um, when I'm addressing my standards. And there's a little tip um, that I learned, and I have a little slide here to show you, um, but if you have a computer tab open, by all means, um, feel free to, to uh, do the example with me. Um, if you go to google.com and, um, and you put in a search term like how technology is used in ELA standards for grade four, <laughs> um, or, or my, the Common Core standards, you may get hundreds of thousands of results. And I think part of the inability to be able to find information, the information that we need quickly and readily, is the fact that many of us really lack the web literacy skills that we need. And and part of those web literacy skills are things as in in the old days. Oh my God, I'm aging. In the in the, in the in the traditional kind of old way of doing this, we used to do Boolean searches, um, where we would put in a keyword and, and say, okay, we're looking for this or that, and we would make sure that the word or was in capital letters. Um, but but today we have um, we have ways to use search operators that will give us more specific results and will really help us and our students find information more clearly and quickly. Um, and one of those ways is, if you notice, um, you can actually set up a search so that if there's a website that you know that the information is on, um, and a lot of times we'll, we'll tell our students to use websites um, like government websites like LOC, libraryofcongress.gov, or, um, or a state website or a university website in order to find something. Um, if you type in the word site 
S-I-T-E colon and put in the domain or that website that you that you want to limit your search to. You can search information just in that website and then do things like use keywords and even key phrases um, in order to find the information that you're looking for. So in this particular example, I was looking for the word digital media in the Common Core State Standards. Um, I left it blank without any kind of grade level, but I could have narrowed it down and said grade nine and put that in quotation marks as well. And what happens then is I'm able to more effectively target the search so that I can find the information I need. And you'll notice that um, in this particular example, I only found 24 results. Now, I promise you, if you had just written in Common Core State Standards, digital right. media, um, that you would have probably found 100,000 <laughs> different, um, different results. And so for a teacher, for an educator who's trying to figure out, okay, what exactly am I supposed to you know, be doing with technology with my students, this is kind of a quick way because corestandards.org is the main website where the Common Core Standards are. And then um, you can use any combination of words. I put digital media, you could have used technology. Um, but this is a great way to kind of be able to find quickly what you need to be doing and how students need to be using uh, digital media or technology in the standards. This first result, uh, if you can read that, it says make strategic use of digital media and visual displays of data to express information and enhance understanding of presentations. Um, digital, the digital media shows up, I think, in grade one. So already in grade one, we're asking students to include some form of digital um, media in their presentations. Wow. Okay. Um, another way that we um, that we need to look at, uh, and I know Diane, if you wanna if you wanna do some of this as well, but another way that we need to look at kind of helping to make that shift uh, in the classroom that we need to, so that students can use technology um, strategically and capably, is we have to look at our roles um, in our schools, and we see what we see. Um, really on a global basis, is that the roles of the educator, of, of the educator, teacher are changing. Um, mm -hmm. I know uh, a gentleman in um, Albemarle School District, Ira Sokol, whose position is actually senior provocateur at edu <laughs> Educology <laughs> Partners. <laughs> That's his position. And then he's the design 2015 project manager. Um, and, and his role is quite fascinating. Um, the school district embarked on this project about three years ago where they wanted, by the end of this year, for every classroom to be redesigned and to, um, to have learning spaces where children could work collaboratively or individually if they wanted to. I mean, their learning spaces include things like tables that have whiteboards on them um, or even on the floor. Um, they have bean bags and sofas and all different kinds of furniture where children, flexible furniture where children can move it if they want to get together and, and work on a problem or, um, you know, or separate themselves if they want to. So, you know, Part of being able to use technology and capably is kind of having that, you know, creating that active learning space. Right. Um, and so it, it's kind of interesting how we're seeing a shift in schools um, through some of these new educator titles or roles. In addition, so it's, huh? redefining the role, it's redefining the role of the teacher, the student, and also redefining space and how we work with space. Yeah. Um, and we actually, Natasha and I are on um, a work group as we define, well, as we actually work with our stakeholders on defining what, it, what does it mean to be a digital district. And that is one of our um, questions. It's like what, what is, as we, as we have foc facilitate focus groups and facilitate um, or push out surveys, and actually even work with our students on, on what, does the, what does the space look like? It's not just how we're using the technology, but what does that environment look like? Yeah, yeah I think it's going to be um, one of our, the part of the survey 
is on the computer, obviously, digitally. But the other part is having some kids uh, actually design some what they think this classroom should look like. So they can design the space, or they can design kind of what they think a lesson would look like in a digital classroom. Um, would it be all the students sitting around in a circle? Or is it you know what format would would they like to see? So it'll be interesting once we start to collect data and uh, get some of the images back. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, something else that we see in terms of um, it's not just it's not just that the role of the teacher is changing, but actually what's happening in classrooms is changing. So I'm going to run a quick video um, that talks about something called uh, Genius Hour, which I'm going to let uh, Diane talk about in in just a minute, but I'm going to play the video first. Hi, my name is Tyler Richards. I'm a senior at Liberty North High School. And I'm Jonathan Thompson. I'm also a senior at Liberty North High School. And we like, like ketchup. ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> And so we settled on this one. I've actually been made fun of for my consumption of ketchup. Let's turn this hair around. <laughs> Why? Well, it's just kind of like, you know, the water stuff whenever you're you know, trying to squirt ketchup onto a hot dog or hamburger bun and the water gets on and sogs it up and it's kind of nasty. And what if it's gross? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next step, I guess, is brainstorming ideas, really. We both spent about a week sketching up ideas in our notebooks. So basically, when you have it like this, there's no way it can go out through there. So when you squeeze the bottle, it forces the ketchup up and over and through the tube. Whereas the bottle can have the bottom at the time. I designed this in our uh, computer-assisted design software and then sent it to Tyler who formatted it and we 3D printed it. But when it sits for a while, the parts separate. So oh. the lighter water will separate from the heavier tank tomato paste. <laughs> Mostly just be kind of fun because you know it's like there's not many classes where you can do a year long research project on ketchup. <laughs> so it's an interesting it's an interesting class. So I wanna know if they're selling this. <laughs> I don't selling this anywhere. <laughs> it's a patent. Believe it or not. Right. Can you imagine? <laughs> but, yeah, I think I need one. <laughs> Unbelievable. So this is it's so coincidental that we started talking about this because earlier in the week, um, uh, Liz Holman, uh, one of our digital learning specialists here, shared a resource that she saw in a Twitter chat. And when you shared this video, it reminded me of of the resources and it's learn it's come to find out it's the same thing, it's the same concept, it's the genius hour, it's you know basically an inquiry based pedagogy that um, we can we use in schools with students where a time is given during the school day so that all the students follow their passion, doesn't that sound great, like figure out what their problem is and they learn about that topic and within their own time they collaborate and they use, they use tools that they need based on the problem and what they need to do. Um, so, in just the other day, these two sh resources were shared. Um, it's about it's a blog post about the Genius Hour. So, if you want to research more, here it is, and also a live binder, um, a great resource by Joy Kerr. And I believe Blanca, you know Joy, is that correct? I know her from Twitter. Believe it or not, <laughs> I'm just funny. Just, yep. <laughs> Thoughts and ideas with her about um, things like this, Genius Hour, and just you know doing something different in the classroom. She's mm -hmm. terrific. And and Natasha, we're actually in our in the district. We have um, a new the expeditionary learning is kind of a similar you know it's that inquiry based pedagogy that we're implementing and we're rolling out. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if all the schools are are implementing it now or if it's in a like kind of the pilot phase, but it aligns to this concept. Mm -hmm. Right now it is in the pilot phase. Um, we It is in grades three through five. In, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly of the um, sample size that we have for the pilot schools. Uh, schools piloting 
EL or expeditionary learning, but it is this, that concept of kind of diving deeper and getting a deeper understanding of, of different texts and different books and collaborating with, your, with other students in the classroom to get there. So you might be asking self, how in the world am I going to be able to become more proficient as an educator, um, not only in learning about how to perhaps redesign my lessons, but now we're talking about learning spaces and we're talking about, um, you know, exchanging ideas. And, you know, the, the one thing that I can say is that if we as educators need to model for our students and for our children um, these types of abilities, skills, and, and ways of communicating. And ISD is one resource um, and they provide a framework um, around the use of technology for learning. And um, we have the website address here, but they have standards, uh, educational technology standards for students, for teachers, for administrators. Um, if you're a technology coach, they have special standards there. And, and it really provides a framework with what things you can do um, in your role to become more proficient um, in the digital world. And so, you know, at whatever role that you're in, as you're watching the video um, or this webinar, you can, there are certainly resources for you that you can find um, standards that you can start to work on, um, whether it's improving the way that you collaborate with others in digital formats or, um, you know, working collegi collegially with others um, in a global society. I mean, because this is a global world that we work in. Um, so, you know, we wanted to provide you at least with the ESD framework. There are several other frameworks that can help you learn how to integrate technology into a classroom at different levels. Um, the SAMR model is another one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And um, both Arizona and Florida off the top of my head have resources that um, are concentrated on, you know, how to help implement technology at different um, at different levels. Um, so as we so as we kind of you know finish up the webinar and just talk about the things that um, that the ways that technology and the Common Core State Standards intersect, we we know for sure that in order to really be able to um, implement technology with confidence, that it requires our schools to make a significant investment in infrastructure, right? So if we're gonna have students connecting online, we need to have wireless networks and we need to have a strong, um, you know, strong bandwidth. Um, we know that in order to help students with the skills that they need to learn, we really need to give them regular access to these types of experiences. And that really means the use of technology becoming seamless in the classroom. It's not, all right, everyone, let's take out the computers and click on this and click on that. Um, eventually, we want to come to a place where students just know that when they want to do something or learn something, they're just going to pick up that computer and do it. And it's not going to be, oh, we're using technology. It's going to be, oh, we're working on a project. Um, we know that we have the ability now to collect all kinds of data, um, whether students are using diagnostic tools to help them with a competency or they are using technology to create um, a story or a message. Um, we know that technology can be used to improve results. You know, so our struggling learners, um, addressing our accelerated learners, you know, helping everybody um, have the tools that they need to actually um, do more and, um, and improve. And of course, we're talking about looking at implementing the Common Core standards with some, some framework out there that can help us um, all achieve the competencies that we need to have as digital, um, as digital citizens and digital learners. But knowing mm -hmm. what we need to do and knowing what the standards are, are really not enough. In order for, uh, for a school or a district to really see significant improvement or transformative change in the classroom, we really need a strong vision and we need leaders at every level. 
And um, I'm sure Diane and, and Natasha that you'll agree that, you know, you can have all the tools, right? And you can have the willpower, <laughs> you can have the, the desire, but without that strong leadership, um, it's just really hard to get from here to there. And I guess before, um, before we kind of leave you with, uh, you know, kind of uh, insight into the last remaining sessions that we have, um, uh, Diana or Natasha, do you want to do you want to say some final words about you know how the Common Core can be supported by technology or some you know kind of some final thoughts? Um, I really like the idea like that you just mentioned in terms of that technology becomes a seamless part of our instruction and a seamless part of student collaboration. That the students are going to be you know researching, creating, and sharing digitally. And really, it, the, integ the integration becomes seamless over time and understanding that there are challenges in the beginning and slowly working through those challenges and collaborating with your colleagues and getting different strategies and techniques to overcome that will make it smoother in the long run. Right. And also, um, as you were summarizing at the end there, both you, Blanca and Natasha made me think of what, what we started with. Um, we talked about Natasha. You had talked about how important it is to, you know, have set the environment and how, you know, we create that environment for our educators to be exploring. And then um, I had added time. So I feel like if we just keep if we keep that on our forefront and plan for, you know, plan for the know that we it's going it has to be there as i said at the beginning it's essential it's not a nice to have it's it's essential so we need to have the planning part in the forefront and we need to set the environment and create the time to do so so with that um, that was great thank you it was a good discussion um, thank you can't believe how time flies actually and we have two more sessions remaining um, and, and next Thursday. It's not going to be Wednesday. It's going to be Thursday of next week. Um, we're going to be speaking about talking about personalizing learning with technology. And and the final session, which is the following Wednesday, June 10th, um, supporting a digital approach to implementing the curriculum. So all of these webinars will be um, videos that will be we will have on our OIT DLT YouTube channel along with many other fabulous videos that you can actually explore at your own time. Um, and also we have a couple of other resources just to share out with you. Um, each, each week we're trying to build upon some resources and at the beginning we spoke about um, research and looking at blogs and how we're finding things. So I wanted to make sure that you, you are aware of our BPS technology blog. Um, we have um, a theme of the month that we post stories about. Um, our digital learning specialists have taken the lead on, on blogging about digital literacies, but also in addition to just us blogging, it's also working with our teachers and educators on how they're using the technologies into their, in their instruction. So. I encourage you to explore and, and the technology blog. And Natasha already spoke about and shared the wonderful History of Boston Busing and Desegregation um, website. Um, so please make sure that you explore that on your own as well. And finally, as we speak of standards, I did want to just um, share with you um, the fact that Massachusetts is actually in the process of rewriting um, the digital literacy and computer science standards and combining it so that it's one set of standards. Um, it's been a year-long process where um, there was, it started with some analysis of both digital literacy standards and computer science standards and, and the panel decided that they would combine and then second phase is the rewriting of the standards and that is just about finished. It will be presented to the um, Board of Education and once that's final, which is the end of June, um, it will be going off of public feedback during the summer before we before the panel revisits any feedback from 
from the public and tweaks it and will be implementing sometime next year. So I'm sharing the link so that you can just kind of stay abreast to that um, information. So look for more info at the end of June. Terrific. Well, thank you both um, for um, collaborating with me and, and facilitating this really important discussion. Uh, I look forward to talking to you in the future about personalized learning um, and, you know, really, you know, sharing examples and learning how Boston Public Schools is, um, is transforming. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Natasha, for joining. And Thanks. thank you, Blanca, for your collaboration and your work. It's been great to have you both on this. I appreciate, I appreciate um, the time. All right, everyone.